Hi, everybody. So you know me, I'm Joe. I coach CEOs from startups to scale-ups to larger enterprises. And today I'm really pleased to be chatting to, to David. Um, David will give his introduction in a minute, but really what I wanted to get out of today is something for you folks out there to truly understand culture, what it is, and really why it's important. Over to you, David. Can you give, a, give yourself an introduction? T tell, the, tell the world about you. Sure. Joe, it's great to be here chatting with you today. Um, so I'm David Bizzer. Uh, I'm an American guy uh, who has been living in Paris for the past 25 years, which actually sounds really long. Uh, I've always been in recruitment, fell into it by accident, first at Netscape in Silicon Valley and uh, had the enormous opportunity to be the first European recruiter for Google uh, and joined Google in 2003, spent seven years with them, ramped the company in Europe from 100 to 5,000 people. Um, and since 2010, I've really been working pretty exclusively with startups and scale-ups, uh, mostly around Europe, to do recruitment, or now we call it the executive search. So I spend most of my day identifying exceptional leadership talent for some of the most exciting, fast growing startups and scale ups, mostly in Europe, sometimes in the US. But I've got this side passion and I think it also comes from way back when I started in Silicon Valley and it's all around culture, um, you know, getting that first exposure to, to Netscape and, you know, the first mini kitchens, <laughs> which people assumed was culture back then. Uh, but seeing Netscape and the development of that, seeing the rise of startups in Silicon Valley, and then uh, participating in that wild journey that was Google, and now seeing just you know how companies are trying to differentiate themselves on a day-to-day -day basis, I think that culture really is one of the most, if not the most, uh, important thing in terms of driving a company's success. Yeah, well, it's interesting because. I think when we talk about culture, we all kind of know what it means, but the definitions are never really laid out properly. Can you give us a definition? How would you define company culture and how important is it for business success? Give us a definition. So there, there's, there's, people will define it in so many different ways, right? I, I do happen to have a preference for Ben Horowitz's definition, which I will just paraphrase, which is basically, you know, how do you feel? about the company 10 years later, what was it like to work there? What do you remember? Mm. And, I, and those things define the culture, uh, the people that you worked with, the clients that you had, the businesses that you grew, um, that that's really what defines it. But maybe that's a little too vague. Maybe that's it's a little a bit too nebulous. Too I mean, I get it because you, know, you talk about feel, but come on. Yeah, let's so, get to it. So then if you want to dig down deeper and say, but, you know, wait a second, what really is it? It's, it's, an, it's an operating model uh, it, or operating principles, right? I think that's the, Amazon calls it leadership principles. But when you look at different companies, people might call them operating principles. To me, it's like, okay, you've determined a set of values or even you haven't determined a set of values, but they exist, right? Culture will exist no matter what. Okay. The operating principles are how you drive those values. It's how you really live those values on a day to day basis. Right. So if I say, you know, we value trust, then how do you show that on a day to day basis? How do you show that to your clients? How do you show that to your employees? Um, and, and do people really then feel it? Right. And so that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because, but it still, it still feels that I'm still feels a little bit not there. there. It's, it's, there. Like, it's like terms like trust as well. So, so again, we all kind of know when trust is there, but what about when some of this is missing then? Is it maybe easier to talk about what happens when the culture, because everybody wants a culture of trust, but yeah. what happens when it's, what's it like when there isn't a strong culture? What's, what's, what's the absence of a strong culture feel like and look like? Well, I, I wouldn't say there, there's an absence of a strong culture. I would say there's an absence of a defined culture and, or, or, or a structured culture, right? I mean, I, I remember I was brought into it to, to a client once where they said to me, look, we know that we're doing really well, but yeah. we don't know why. We don't know what's the, what's the magic, right? Yeah. So, so, so tell us what the magic is. Why are we actually doing so well? Because we're not sure we know ourselves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
the culture will evolve. It just happens. You don't have to do anything and you're going to have a culture. People are going to say, you know, you could ask somebody, you know, what's the culture like at your company? And people will tell you something, mm -hmm. right? And is that what the CEO thinks? Is that what the founder thinks? Not necessarily. Oftentimes, not at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the most surprising things that I've run into in, in talking to so many people about culture is that most of the time, people don't have the same definition. People don't have the same ideas. Um, they have their own. Um, and so it's that idea that if you spoke to what 10 different people in the business, they'd all give you a different answer about what the culture was. That's the thing. That's the thing. It's very, very rare that you would do an exercise like that and have everybody really aligned. Yeah. It happens, but it's rare. So I like the way you talked about it, kind of the idea of it's structural. So it's structural magic almost. It's like you're taking this stuff that's quite nebulous, like culture generally, which is often seen in the founders of a startup or their ethos. And you take that and you properly structure or define it. And then it almost, I suppose, do you give people a, a set of like operating guide rails or guidance to sort of be able to live that culture? How does that sort of then, let's talk more about that, the practicalities yeah. of structuring that magic. So, so to me, I've, I've always tried to, you know, figure out, okay, first you, you need to understand, right? What, what, what is the foundational culture in this business? What do people think that it really is? You, you have to have a baseline to, to talk about, right? Um, you can ask people in a company who tell me what you think the values are. And even if, I think I already said this, but it, it, even if there aren't any values, people will tell you what they think the values are, right? Okay, that's fine. But then how do you live those values, right? So it actually comes down to um, how do you define certain values? So if you go back to trust, right? I mean, that, this is a it's a tough one, right? Everybody wants that, right? You wouldn't say our value is untrust or, or, or not trustworthy or whatever you say, right? I mean, everybody wants that, but how do you actually define it? And, and once you've defined it, is everybody on board with that definition? Is everybody aligned with that? And how I've gone about trying to figure out how to define a certain value is first trying to figure out what are the behaviors that you want people to elicit, mm. right? Because if you can get to the behaviors, then you can get to the definition and then you can confirm that, yeah, this is really one of our core values because this is how we live and breathe it. So let's take that one trust then. Have you come across any examples of using that one where sort of that next step? So our, our belief is how, how do you, how would you then take that to the step further of then saying, well, how can you demonstrate this is happening? How would you take that a step further? Yeah. And so, 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 you know, this is what I'm doing in the company that I work with today, key search, right? And, and so I pulled trust uh, off the top of my head because that's the number one value that we have, that we've defined, right? And so for us, it's actually very, very clear. You know, our business is based on forming long lasting relationships based on trust. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> it's as simple as that. That, 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 that's our business, right? Um, but you have to see if you're actually doing that on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so what do those behaviors entail? And then more importantly to me, it's well. Are you really living up to it? And the only way you can really figure out if you're living up to it is if you measure it. Right. And, 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 and this is something that I came to relatively recently because measuring values is not obvious at all. Well, I'm guessing it's not very easy either. I mean, how do you measure trust? That sounds how, I mean, what, how do you do that? So I'm not going to stake a claim and say I've figured it out a hundred percent. Because I think this is evolving and I think culture is always evolving. Something else we can talk about. Um, but in terms of measurement, what we've decided to do is, so, so we do executive search, right? Just to make things clear, right? So all of our work is pretty much project-based. So we go out and we hire a certain uh, leader for a certain company. After every single project, we'll hold a debriefing session with the client. And we've come up with questions that are aligned with our values that we pose to the client and say, how would you rate us on this? Okay, so we take trust out and we say, do you feel like a relationship with trust was established for this project? Do you feel like you were always kept up to date? Do you feel like we were very transparent with you? Um, and, and these, you know, list of questions and then say, okay, give us a score. Okay, 
So give us a score. That's the best we can do, right? I mean, are there other ways to measure it? Sure. But also you have to be careful and not going to measure hell <laughs> where you're just, you know, trying to over measure the whole thing, right? You want to make sure that you're following the line that you're, you, you know, you, you say, this is who you are. This is how you behave. Then make sure you're behaving that way. And what better way for your clients and then take it a step further for your candidates in our case, uh, um, to also give you that feedback and tell you that, you know, you created that very trustful relationship with them from the very beginning. And then, you know, you're going the right way. And when people start giving you feedback that they don't think you did as well as you could, then you have ways to improve. Yeah. Right. And so, so for us, you know, one of the, and, and, and again, it's evolving. One of our key criteria and things that we're looking at for everyone in the, in the company is, is how well are you doing on those scores, right? We, you know, we want a certain percentage um, for everyone in the company in terms of these debriefs. And that's going to allow us to say very, very confidently, yeah, our clients trust us. Right. And I can also then, I suppose you can take a baseline when you first start and you can see how that can improve over time. It gives you a, a strong idea, also what the most trustworthy members of the team are like. You know, it allows you then to upskill everybody else is once you have that definition and that measurement criteria, you can see how then that can spread across the organization. That's really interesting. Well, what creates trust, right? Yeah. You know, you, 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 you have to get to that point. And, and we also actually, we do it, um, I wouldn't say, you know, in depth, but every week there's a traffic light with the project, right? And and it's like, how do you think this project is going? Red, yellow, green. So it's 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 constant feedback and co and, and constant request for feedback, right? Not to just assume that everything's going okay because the numbers look good. Yeah. People are actually, yeah, we're happy with the way this process is going. No, I really like that. So what I think what's really interesting then is we have the two sides of it then, don't we? Because often, and I've certainly seen this, and you probably have as well, that culture often stops at the C-suite coming up with like the 10 definitions of their cult company culture, sticking it on a poster, sending it out as a memo, you know, it's on the back of a toilet door, but then that's the end of it, right? It's up on the wall, therefore, you know, yeah, they, we've got a culture, everybody can point at it, but then that's kind of where it stops. And then you've got the other extreme where you just talked about there, where it's, you know, you're measuring it almost 24 seven. What about yeah. that messy middle bit? Cause it's not just as simple as like, what, how does the messy middle bit, how do you go from that definition through to the, to, to the situation you just described? Yeah. So, 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 you know, when I first started working in this space, what I did was I created something called a culture audit, right? Again, you, you need to understand what's going on. You need to kind of get to a state of the union. Um, so what do people think about the culture? And that's, you know, the very first step. And yeah. that comes through talking to people. I know a lot of companies today use uh, software to do check pulse surveys or employee satisfaction surveys and things like that. And it's definitely part of the toolkit. But one of the reasons that I really like interviews is that you can just dig and get a lot more information and find out how people really feel, right? If, if you're good at getting things like that out of people. Um, and so, yeah, so you, you're right, because you talk about, you've got the what there, haven't you? But you haven't got the why and the interviews allow you to get to the why and no software can help you get to the why as quickly as a human talking to another human to interrogate. Them. I don't think so. I don't yeah. think so. It's always it about. Is, it's amazing. Fun. You know, it's amazing. You find out things really quickly. People open up. Right. They, they, they like to talk about this stuff. You know, why yeah. did, why did you join the company? What attracted you to the company yeah. in the first place? Right. Um, why do you stay here? Yeah. So just the, these questions get people, you know, really talking about what they feel about the company and, and, and mm -hmm. what makes it tick. Um, so, you know, w when I did this internally for, for our business, for key search, we've spent over a year over a year in this process. And like I said, I don't think it's fully baked. I don't think it's totally done. It's very advanced, um, but I don't think it'll ever be finished because I think it has to constantly evolve. So a lot of this is around discussion, right? yeah. a lot of discussion. When we got to the point that we said, okay, we think, and I, and I, and I reiterate, we think 
trust is one of the values because you can put stuff out there, but you have to validate that that's really, you know, yeah. we spent, I would say almost two months, um, having a meeting once a week talking about trust. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, we have a small company, so we have that advantage of everybody being able to participate if they want to. So we had a really, really high participation rate. Um, but we talked about just trust for a couple of months. Um, and, 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 and you could see how people started to, to act differently because of these conversation yeah. and, and how people uh, not necessarily spoke differently, but, but, uh, communicated differently via Slack messages or email, um, awesome. that became something that, that people were really tied into. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's through that discussion and getting people to come to the conclusion that, yeah, this is what we mean. It's not just throwing a word out there, putting on a piece of paper, a coffee mug, whatever. It's like, no, 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 You know, we're talking about specific behavior that people are going to embody. And therefore, people are going to be much more likely to have this high level of trust. So it's not that it's not a top-down exercise, is it then? It's not like the founders or the C-suite oh, kind of ten value. No. Team no. doing this. It's not top down. It can't, it can't be based on what you've just it's talked. It's not top down, but, 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 but you cannot do this without the explicit uh, engagement and commitment from the CEO slash founder uh, and hopefully their leadership team. Without that, forget it. You're doomed. You're doomed. The, the, the CEO cannot delegate this away. They, yeah. they have to be present. They have to support it. They have to back it up. They have to engage. Yeah. And that, that's, that's something that, that I've, I've learned through some trial and error. So it has to be everybody involved in this then. So this is a approach where you kind of, you talk about the audit where there's, you have these interviews with everybody in the business, including the, the leadership, so, especially the leadership team. You, you know, it, it, okay. You, you in most cases, because companies, you know, grow and, and, and become more populous or populated, um, you can't involve everyone, no. right? You can't. No. So when you start with the audit, um, I'm pretty convinced, and I'm sorry, but I don't have scientific data to prove this, but I'm pretty convinced in just about any size company, you can talk to between 12 and let's say 25 so big companies, people from different parts of the company, different tenure, different seniority, different functions, um, and you will get the idea of what's going on. You, you don't need to talk to that many people for that part of it, okay? Um, and then once you've done this audit and you have all this information and you feel pretty confident about the state of the union thing, then you can go into, you know, okay, let's move towards this value definition piece, yeah. right? That, that, that's kind of the, the first step. And, and, and how do you get to that? One, you can involve a lot more people because you can do relatively simple exercises with a lot of people in, in even in large groups where people contribute to the value creation in terms of saying, you know, pick five words okay. know, from this sheet of eight. Right. And, 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 you know, people will pick the words and they'll talk about it and you'll say, why did you pick that word? What's important to you? Blah, 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 blah. And then you can get a lot of people, right? So, so my example is working with a company with, you know, I had about 3,000, 4,000 people. So I interviewed maybe 25 and then I did that exercise with about 120, 150, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had tons of input, like more than enough, more than enough. Right. But. It's at that point where you're like, okay, there are some people that you're going to identify through that process who are really into this. And yeah. those are going to be come to your committee or your champions or whatever you want to call it. And I think one of the best examples of a larger company that I've seen go through a process like this, and, and maybe not exactly the way I'm describing it, but something close is uh, Twilio. Mm -hmm. and, and if you search Twilio, CEO, values, whatever, yeah. he, he gives some talk about it. Right. And, and it's really, really well done. And he yeah. talks, we had a culture committee or a value committee, whatever he calls it. And there was, you know, 12 people, 15 people, and they would have dinners regularly. And, 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 you, know, you, and you hash through it and you hash through yeah. it. That's really interesting. So, and it, but it takes time then. And it takes a commitment from 
the leadership, but a, like a subset of the team to be able to do that. And it's got to be something that happens across the organization for this to really, and it sounds like it emerges as well, rather than it being defined. Yeah. It sort of emerges yeah, from the absolutely. Back. Absolutely. So if I was a CEO in this position, I'd be a little bit, I might be a little bit worried. I may not sound a bit, a bit worried. What happens if the culture comes back from the wider organization and it's not what I want it, leave it to be, <laughs> right? So what if it comes back that I want it to be, we move fast and we get, you know, we, we ship quickly and we build, build great things. And the team comes back and says, no, we are an organization that takes our time and does things with quality. For example, I mean, that's quite a stark difference, but what happened? I'm, I'm worried it's going to come back and it's not going to be yeah. what I want it to be. What, what advice would you give me if I've got that feeling? So first of all, the CEO is still the CEO, right? And in, 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 unless you're working in some kind of, you know, fully, uh, what would you call it? You know, extremely democratic, uh, you know, everybody has a vote or, or whatever. The CEO still has, I think, some sway in terms of saying, you know, this is one thing that is really, really important to me. And, and I need this to be in there. But also the CEO can hopefully have an ally and whoever is running this project, somebody's going to be running this project yeah. behind the scenes, right? And, yeah. and when I say the CEO needs to be engaged, by no means do I mean the CEO is going to be running this project by themselves. Somebody's going to be project managing this whole thing. And that person should be a sounding board to the CEO of, okay, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, this, you know, run fast uh, component is still in our, in our, you know, blood. Um, and so we need to make sure that's integrated into the workshops that we're doing so that it comes through. And even in our own process, I saw our CEO, you know, get hooked on certain ideas and, and she pushed them, right? And, and you, knew, you knew that that was something that was really important to her and that, you know what, even if we all said we don't like that, it's still going in there. But this is an intelligent woman and she's able to, you know, bring the team together and say, you know, no, we totally get this. This totally makes sense. So yeah, uh, by, by no means should you feel that you would end up being stuck with a bunch of stuff that you don't like, unless you're not engaged at all. And, and, and then you've got bigger problems. Okay. <laughs> well, let's, let me pick, pick that one apart then. So what if yeah. you are engaged in this? What if you figure, oh, I'm going to going to go out and find a you know a cultural consultant who's going to come back and tell me what my culture is and yeah. tell me what to do and implement it all for me and I'm just going to nod in the odd meeting and maybe they'll send me an email with it and a pdf and I'll be happy yeah. what what if I want it to be that way is that going to you know that sounds like an easy way of me doing it to see it could I do it that way I think you have an extremely high risk of failure yeah that point. And, and, and I, well, let's just say so far, I haven't figured out a way around it. I haven't figured out a way to engage the CEO in some kind of low touch fashion. Like I really think they have to commit to it, right? One of the things when, when I do talks about culture, one of the things I think that I highlight in probably every single talk is, you know, at Google, Eric Schmidt, Larry Page, and Sergey Brin spent hours every Sunday afternoon, right? Yeah. And that was to highlight Sunday afternoon, right? Talking yeah. about what they wanted this company to be because they knew that it was immensely important that they had to spend the time on it. I mean, can you imagine that, yeah. right? They spent hours every Sunday afternoon, you know, the leadership team uh, or the executive committee, whatever you call it at Google, in the early days, and I think up until about 10,000 employees, which is very significant, spent like 20% of their time on hiring one day a week, Yeah, which is in, in, intricately tied to culture, right? Because the people that you bring in make your culture. I mean, so, so if, it, if that doesn't say it's strong enough, I don't know what does. And so to commit. We well, have to commit, but it, it's interesting as well because there's two sides to look at it as well. Because culture can be seen as being emotional, touchy feely, nebulous again, right? There, yeah. I'm the CEO, right? This is going to cost me money and time to do this. Where's the business yeah. value from this? I want to look at this from a cold, hard, numerical point of view. Yeah. Or you know, making my life easier, whatever it might be. But I know I've got to do it, and people are telling me I should do it, and it, yeah. But it, w what's the business value? What do I get from doing this? What comes my way? people that are so stoked to be there because they feel it and they believe in this stuff 
And they say, you know what, if we go this way and these are our values and actually people are behaving the way that we say they're behaving, we've got, you know, the utmost uh, chance for success. And, 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 you know, I mean, this is, this is topical considering what's happened over the past couple of days, but you know, oh, with that, you, open AI and yeah, you, so, so, you, so you saw the part where I think it was 700 plus of 700 something employees said, if we don't get him back, we're leaving to join him at Microsoft. That's insane. I mean, I mean, that's amazing. And and there, I saw debates about this on, on, on Twitter and what have you saying, yeah, well, that's bullshit because they're just talking about it because of the, the, the stock options and, and, and all the money that's involved and la, la, la. I don't think so. I don't no. think so. I think that there's something very, very special there that, that Sam Altman created. And, and, and you can't put a price on that, mm. right? I mean, that, that's huge. And when you think about, I mean, the vast majority of those people are probably brilliant. Yeah. So you have all these incredibly intelligent people all behind the same kind of vision, all, you know, totally backing up the leader. What CEO wouldn't want to be in that position? All right. So, so the benefits then you get are that the, the team are on board. Everybody's you know, pushing in the same direction. They're happy to be there. So recruitment, retention of staff is, is way easier because you have these, the shared culture that everybody understands and lives. And they're just, you know, excited about coming to work. Right. Okay. Again, I can see, definitely see the benefit from that. But can we get any closer to the bottom line with some of this stuff as yeah. well? What about things yeah. like customer sales or customer churn. If I'm yeah. running a SaaS company, right? Yeah. My engineers, you know, it's great. My engineers are happy and all, but actually how's that going to, how's that going to hit the bottom line of the numbers that I care about, my ARR, my MRR, all of those sort of numbers. How's this, how's culture going to do that for me? So, so the culture is going to help you one, reach your objectives because people will want to hit those objectives. But never mind anything that I can, you know, talk about. I think you want to see proof. And there's a study from, I think you'll know, the great place to work. Uh, it, it is an association yeah. or whatever it's called. Great place to work. Uh, they published a study, if not more than one, uh, looking at the stock price over a significant period of time of companies that one great place to work. And compared to like, uh, what do you call it in the UK, the Russell 100 or something? C100, mm -hmm. the average, yeah, the fortune, yeah, the average, yeah. I think it's 30% above something. I don't oh, remember wow. that yeah, my head, yeah. but it's significant. It's significant. And so that, that's the one thing that I, that I found that talks about, you know, financial impact with very, very strong yeah. culture and that it makes a really big difference. And, and, and I think that that's where it is, right? Because again, um, the culture is what is going to attract people to work there. The culture is, is going to be what keeps people but inside the company is going to want people to do better at the company. So I, I think it has a massive, massive, massive impact. And what about in the kind of outside of pointing outside of the company as well? So how does it, can it, how does it reflect in things like brand, for example, of an organization or, you know, how does it, how can it be used as a customer attractant and retainer in terms of that? How can a culture sort of be pointed outwards? Cause we're talking a lot of internally. How can you point your culture outwards? What does that, what sort of benefits can you get from that? I hope you don't mind me throwing this up here, but you know, here, here are the values, right. From, from key search that we put together, um, mm -hmm. this is part of a presentation that I can give to clients when I'm, uh, pitching our business, right? How many executive search firms do you think are using their value in a client pitch? Yeah. Probably none, probably mm -hmm. none. Right. And I love to talk about it. Yeah. Right. Because it's, it, it's like, look, you know, we're really serious about this, right? Yeah. Again, I said earlier, we're, we're, our foundation is building long lasting relationships based on trust. Okay. And, and, and we spent over a year talking about how much this means to us. Yeah. Right. And these are the five things that we think about pretty much every day. And we know that if we, are guided by these values, we're going to deliver an exceptional service.
No, that makes sense. And so again, if I'm if I'm that SaaS founder then, and I I'm taking trust here, right, as as the one to talk. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. So I'm pointing that out to my customers, right? And my goal is from trust is to build long lasting relationships with my customers, right? Well, you can totally see how that makes sense in the SaaS world, can't you? Because then you're building, you know, you're reducing your churn. You've got longer term contracts with your customers. They're happier. They're recommending you. And also, I suppose to a certain extent, those decisions and those micro decisions that are made by not only customer service, but also your engineers are going to be, they're going to have trust in the back of their head when they're making choices. So they're going to be like, well, how can I get my, how can I build this feature with trust customers so customers trust us more? How can I be a customer support agent? How can I get my customer to trust me more? If I've got that in my head and I'm living that, you can see how that can then strengthen the relationship you have with your customers in a really practical equals dollars type way, can't you? It, 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 this this brings me back to to your original question, right? Where where I didn't give my own definition, right? Which I actually do have, and and you, and you reminded me of it now. Yeah. So 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 for me, it's always been about three things. It's been about decisions or decision making, behavior, and communication. Okay, I love this. Yeah. Those are the three things. And now when you take those three things and you put them in the context of what you just said about thinking about how we operate, right? How do I take this decision, right? How do I behave in this challenge? How do I communicate to my employees? And you have this guiding light or these guiding values, principles, whatever, then it's gold. Absolutely. It's gold. Right. It's like, this is how we operate here. And, 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 and I think, you know, one of the biggest companies and, and, and the best ones, no matter what you think about, about the, the business and how it operates is Amazon. Right. I mean, they've lived by the same, I think it's 14 leadership principles for a very long time. And if you ever get a chance to like, look at them, they're, they're really meaningful. Right. Yeah. And the thing is, is that some people will think, oh, no, 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 I don't like that. Well, fine. Good for you. Don't go there. Right. This is beautiful. Right? Yeah. That's what I love about a strong culture. It, it allows people to identify or not identify with it. That makes a right. lot of sense. I mean, it's, it's a fit from a fit point of view, doesn't it? You fit, you know, if you fit, if you, if you align with that culture, you know, it's going to be a good fit. And if you don't, if that doesn't make, if that, you don't see that yourself in that, then you know, it's not going to be an easy ride for you to take that job. It should be a two-way street for you be able to look at the culture and go, do you know what? That isn't me. I could take this job, but I'm maybe not going to be happy because that's not exactly what the culture or the values that I Absolutely. want to work under. Absolutely. There, mm -hmm. There's, um, I worked with this company for a couple of years, a Norwegian company. Um, the CEO of this company is probably the most intense individual that I've ever worked with. Right. Yeah. And, and he spent a massive amount of time building the culture. Right. To the extent that they, they printed a culture book that must have been, I don't know, 75, 80 pages. Right. I mean, really, really detailed getting into even how they send emails or write emails. Right. And, and there was a real intensity at, the, at this company. And, you know, for me as a, as a recruiter, I loved it because I was able to put that in front of people and say, this is really how it is. Right. Yeah. So, and, and if you're shocked and you think that this isn't something that you could work with, then this place just really isn't for you. But if you look at this material and you're like, wow, I want to be a part of this, then perfect. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. And, and that place was one of the very few, very rare places where when I talked to people and I did my culture on it, everybody said the same thing. Everybody mm -hmm. said the same thing. It was amazing. Well, the reason is, is because the CEO not only invested a massive amount and, and, and spent a lot of time building his culture, but he also had his, his mantras, right? That he just repeated over and over and over and over again, right? I mean, I can still give you his speech, right? And it's been several years that I, I work with Chuck, right? Because it's just, you know, I'm going to drive this in. Right. And this yeah. is who we are. This is who we are. Don't ever forget it. Um, it, 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 it. So that, that's, that's the test then. So if you could, you as the CEO can talk to almost to anybody in the company, ask them, ask that person what the values are. They should be able to repeat them back to you. 
Exactly. What are the values? What's the culture of the company? Whatever it is, right? You know, you're going to get this. And thing. you know you're successful. And then you've got that that middle bit as well, which you talk about the decision, the behavior, and the communication. I like those three things as well. So then you can sort of see it in action as well. If decisions are being made in reference back to the culture, you know that it's it's working. If you see people behaving in that way, if you do just dip into the some calls in the customer support team or some emails from that, if you see that coming through in the communication, you know it's being successful yeah. as well. Then right through to the measurement at the end, you can spot that measurement and see, well, I'm measuring it here in terms of these, because we, we know what that means now. Our customers know what that means. If we're measuring it all the way through, we know it's successful. So you can see all the way through then from a very operational point of view, if you've got it right or not. Absolutely. And that, it just makes sense because then, then it doesn't feel as nebulous yeah. or as intangible as it did, you know, when we started this conversation. That's fantastic. Yeah, I really like that. Mm. And so last question then, for you, because you work internationally, you mentioned that you sort of, you're an American in Paris the last 25 years. What, how, does, how does culture travel? from US corporations into Europe and Europe, European corporations into the US and across the world. Does it transport where? How do you transport it? How do you adapt it to being in an international global business? So this is, you know, the ultimate question, right? Okay. Because, I mean, really, it's hard. It's hard because let's not forget, we're talking about corporate culture or organizational culture, right? Then there's culture, <laughs> right? Everybody comes from a different culture and there's tons of cultures and tons of subcultures. And, and how do you deal with all of that? Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that first and foremost, it's these values that can align people. Right. If, if you talk about trust, okay, everybody worldwide can understand what that means. Once you've defined it and you say, these are the behaviors that create trust. And I don't think you're going to have much of an issue with that. Right. Um, but th then our, our second uh, on the list is something called raising the bar. Right? Yeah. So raising the bar could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? It also elicits, um, you know, a high performance environment, I think, right? That people are always looking at, you know, do better, do better, do better. Right? And, and, and maybe that, you know, rubs some people the wrong way, too aggressive or too... Oh, well, sure. I mean, right down to raise the bar being an idiom in English as well, right through to it being language defined as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like what, it, what, what does that mean? So that's, that's where, you know, the, 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 sorry, the definition and the behaviors come into play that, you know, p you need to get people on board with those and feeling comfortable with those. Um, but, I, but I think there are some things that actually don't necessarily, you know, work everywhere. And, and, and how do you get over those? I don't know. I mean, here, here's my example, or at least the one that comes straight to mind, right? So um, at Google, uh, I was doing a lot of European-wide recruiting, right? Um, in, in Dublin, we hired people from all over Europe because we needed people who spoke you know, many, many, many different languages. And one of the big things at Google at the time, I have no idea what it's like now, at the time was that you, your candidates or people who wanted to work at Google needed to be super enthusiastic, right? That's very yeah. American, right? Yeah. You know, I can't wait. Yeah. Well, it's okay. you, know, you, you have to be super enthusiastic. And so we're going out and talking to people in Finland, okay? They're not overly expressive. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you would collect the interview feedback from a Finnish candidate and the, and the hiring managers would say, yeah, no, they're not really enthusiastic about coming here. Wait a second. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and, and that was a big thing. That was part of yeah. Google's culture. Like you had to be enthusiastic. Right. So, you know, well, what do you do about it? Well, you try to get people to understand different culture. In terms of international culture, you also try to find the rare fins that are a little bit more expressive. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 you can't have this globally perfectly aligned culture, but I think you can have something where you can still take into account local differences, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, the French alone, right? Uh, compared, compared to, to the American 
totally different, right? I mean, I, I always say the Americans are black and white. The French live in the gray zone, right? You know, we're very much like, Donovan, like let's talk about it for hours and maybe it'll never get done. But, but, but um, you know, you have to allow for these differences, but I think there are these guiding principles that, that everybody's going to live with, right? So, so if I stay on the Google examples, for me, the one that I always pull out is that one of the, I don't, I don't think, I think they've changed it a lot, but one of the original 10 guiding principles was something around data and being data driven. And that was worldwide, right? Yeah. And, and you learned that very fast at Google. If you wanted to get anything done, you had to bring the data to the table because if you didn't, you weren't going anywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there are those types of things. It's like, okay, I get that. And, and that's the culture here, right? You have to have the data or else you have no argument. And that works across the board, right? So people always ask me these questions. Can you have subcultures? Can you have, you know, different functions have different cultures? Sure, there's always going to be, you know, gangs of people doing different things. But, it, you know, those very core values, they need to fit across the board. Wow. Interesting. Fascinating. But I like your point there of taking certain elements that can be global and are very easily defined to be global, but then also those ones that may have cultural subtleties or differences and adapting them to that place or helping support the team in that place to understand why part of the organization or the mothership might feel that way about something, but actually this is how you do it and this is what it means and this is how you talk to it. So being very open with the fact that cultures are different and understanding where those differences are both from an international point of view, but and then adapting your internal culture to fit those. I really like that idea. Rather than just trying to force it on a, a particular nation or group of people, your culture, you can't do that. That's not going to work. Love that. Great. Well, hey, David, I've really enjoyed our time today. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm, I'm, I really enjoyed it. I, um, where can people learn a bit more about you? Where can they find out, see more of your talks? You mentioned the culture audit. Where, where's more? Where can they find more? from you out there well i mean i guess the only place i really am is linkedin um but if you do type my name into youtube you'll be able to pull up some talks okay um, my favorite culture talk was one that i gave at the greek national tourism federation annual <laughs> conference why that one i just i i really really hey. enjoyed it all um, right and I think it, I think it came off pretty well. So so that would be a fun one to watch. And 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 if not, uh, you know, you have more to to choose from from different different events. Okay. I'll grab some from there as well. And can people contact you as well? What's the best way to get in touch if they want to learn more about yeah. you? To ask about questions to talk about key search. What where can they get more information yeah. from you? David at keysearch.com. All right, I'll make sure that's in there as well. Great. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. A really good time. Thanks for having me. We're done. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Thank That's you. Fun. I learned a lot. I really That's loved fun. that decision behavior communication thing. I'm glad, glad it came back. I'm glad you came back there. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That's really, because that's that missing middle bit, isn't it? About how it works. It's like yeah. telling people, here's your culture. Here's how you do it. Let's yeah. measure that off the back of it. Because then people can see where they need to do it. I really like that bit. The DBC. It's kind of cool. Is that, though, was that yours, think. by the way, that decision behavior? communication yeah yeah I it's mean, not that it must have come from somewhere right i mean nobody has any real unique ideas but yeah I, but that's really good because that's there's definitely something there i think in terms of it because it it's like suddenly it's like oh practically i can see how this works now it's that missing middle bit yeah between, you yeah. know that poster on the wall and the mug and then the output it's i really like it yeah uh, I like i like i actually think that it can, having it come up in the middle is not a bad thing because People can hear what we were talking about before yeah. and then relate it more um, to, to the overall content. So I think that was... Well, I mean, it'll, yeah, it'd be a good clip on its own, that bit, I think. Great. Cool. Thank you so much again for your time. Oh, and we're chatting again in a few weeks. On. The other way around. You're going to interview me, I believe. So yeah. that was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Look forward to it. Cheers. And thank you so much again. Yeah. My pleasure, Joe. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Take care.